Hello everybody, it's Mr. Arosena, and on today's video we're going to be talking about some applications of electrochemistry. So, the first one we'll talk about, it's kind of a little late considering the time of the year. Normally this lines up much better with grad ceremonies and whatnot. But anyways, uh, this first example is the breathalyzer. So the breathalyzer works in that it uses a dichromate solution to oxidize ethanol. Now ethanol is the main component in most uh, consumable alcohols. There are other alcohols out there um, like methanol and propanol and so on, but ethanol is the one that is consumed and is the one that is present in most alcoholic beverages. Anyways, so the breathalyzer works in that it has this uh, dichromate solution, so that's this here, potassium dichromate, and in the presence of ethanol, so this substance, uh, the ethanol gets oxidized and the dichromate becomes um, this substance here. Now, this substance, the chromium sulfate, will dissolve into chromium ions, and the chromium ions end up making the solution look green. More chromium ions that are present, the greener the solution. So the breathalyzer will actually measure just how green the solution is after somebody has breathed into it. Now, where does the ethanol come from? How does it get into your breath? The ethanol is uh, actually present in your blood when you consume alcohol. And as the blood circulates in your body, the ethanol will eventually make its way to the alveoli in your lungs. Now the alveoli, sorry, the bloodstream will transfer the ethanol from your blood into the alveoli, and when you breathe out, the ethanol leaves with your carbon, with your breath. So because this is an equilibrium, uh, the more ethanol that's in your blood, um, the equal, that will cause the eth more ethanol to get into your alveoli, and therefore more ethanol will leave when you breathe out. So that's how the ethanol gets into your lungs, is that as you consume alcohol, the ethanol gets concentrated in your blood. Because of equilibrium, uh, the alveoli doesn't have a lot of uh, ethanol in it, so Le Chatelier's principle tells us that the equilibrium suggests that the alveoli, sorry, the ethanol will leave your bloodstream, go into your alveoli, and then when you breathe out, it breathes out ethanol. So the more ethanol that you have consumed, the more ethanol will show up in the alveoli, so that's this portion here, and then more of that will leave when you breathe out. Now, when you exhale into the breathalyzer, the ethanol that's in your breath uh, will get funneled into here. It'll react with the dichromate solution, and then the solution will turn green, and the, meth the breathalyzer will measure how green it is. Based on how green it is, it will determine just how much ethanol was present in your blood. And this is usually referred to as the uh, blood alcohol content, or, B or blood alcohol content concentration, BAC, and depending on what percentage of it turns back, it'll determine whether you are fit to drive or not. And that all depends on kind of like what your what the jurisdiction uh, determines the um, maximum BAC is. Okay. Now, this brings us to an interesting uh, topic in that how can you actually beat the breathalyzer? Um, because the breathalyzer... Um, depends on how much ethanol is in your breath, the only way to really beat the breathalyzer is to somehow react the ethanol in your breath and turn it into something that is not ethanol, or basically to react the alcohol into something that's not an alcohol. And there are kind of three ways that I've thought of that you can do this relatively easily that doesn't require too many, um, doesn't require any strange uh, reagents, I guess. So the first one is if you can combust the ethanol in your breath, then that would basically get rid of all the ethanol. However, the problem with this is that if you want to combust the ethanol in your breath, you basically take a lighter and try to light the ethanol on fire that's in your breath, and that might not turn out very well for you. It also would look really, really strange if the officer were watching you uh, try and set your mouth on fire. Uh, second, you could dehydrate the alcohol using a strong acid. Now, your body produces a strong acid um, in the stomach, 
So you could induce vomiting to try and react the ethanol with the hydrochloric acid from your stomach, um, but then vomiting in front of an officer while they're trying to give you a breathalyzer is probably not the best thing to do. Um, the third one is that you could use an organic acid because the organic acid will react with alcohol to create uh, soap, um, but then the soap substance would be in your mouth and you could start foaming or bubbling while you're doing this. It also might look kind of strange if the officer sees you consuming large amounts of organic acid. Uh, the simplest one to obtain would be vinegar, but again, um, you could start forming soap in your mouth and as that sort of reacts with your saliva, you could start showing soapy bubbles foaming out of your mouth, which probably won't look very good. Um, at the end of the day, the best way to beat the breath is to simply not drink and drive. So that's probably the best option. Alright, another example, and we've talked about this in previous lessons, is the battery. The battery is basically just an electrochemical cell, but made bigger. Uh, some batteries will actually be composed of multiple electrochemical cells. This has allowed us to store electricity and carry it around in very portable forms. So alkaline batteries are a good example. They're the smallest, probably smaller type of battery we're quite familiar with, like the regular AA, AAA batteries, those things. And this is basically composed of a, a basic electrolyte and you have a zinc carbon electrode pair. Depending on the electrode pair, you can create uh, stronger batteries with more voltage. And you can also create rechargeable batteries as well, depending on the electrode pair that you use. An extension of this is the lead acid storage battery. This is what's basically a car battery. It's a very common um, common use of is in car batteries and other large batteries like that. The great thing about this particular battery is that its reaction is actually reversible. Um, so what this battery is made of is you have alternating plates of solid lead and lead oxide. And all of this is stored in, not really stored, but it's placed in a solution of or sulfuric acid, that's sulfuric acid. And it has the following reaction. So this is the reaction that the battery uh, would undergo normally. The lead and the lead oxide, uh, because of the highly acidic nature, will combine to create lead sulfate and water. Now the lead sulfate, this will dissolve into Pb2 plus ions and SO4 2 minus ions. So as this, as this battery operates, so as, the, as we get voltage from this battery, the solid plates eventually dissolve into lead ions and sulfate ions and some water. So if you have your car and it's just drawing energy from it, so like you have your car and you're listening to the radio but you don't have the engine running, this is what the battery is doing. It's using up the solid lead and solid lead oxide to create electricity. Now the great thing about this type of battery is that the, re the reaction is reversible. So we can recharge the battery by using an external source of power. And we basically supply an equivalent amount of energy to cause the reverse reaction to occur. By doing this, uh, we can take our dissolved lead sulfate and we can create, recreate the solid lead and the solid lead oxide. Okay, this is what happens when you have the engine running. When the engine's running, uh, some of the energy from the engine goes towards recharging the battery. So if any of you have ever encountered um, a dead battery, this is why they always tell you after you've started the car, let the car run for half an hour to an hour. And what that does is that the engine is providing energy to turn your dissolved lead sulfate into solid lead and solid lead oxide. This way your battery can then be sort of recharged. And in, in all honesty, most rechargeable batteries operate in a very similar manner. The difference is that rather than using lead and sulfuric acid, they'll use different electrodes. Okay, so like your 
electronic device batteries in your say phone or laptop or whatever any rechargeable battery operates the same way this is why we have to plug them in because that's where we get our external source of power all right so that's so those, those are kind of two applications of electrochemistry and we can apply them in sort of different ways the battery is especially the batteries especially all right now another application of um Electrochemistry. It's not really an application, but we can use electrochemistry to sort of fight this phenomenon, and that's rusting or corrosion of metals. Uh, rusting is specifically uh, referring to the oxidation of iron or the corrosion of iron. For other metals, we simply just call it corrosion. Uh, the process is still is very similar, though, and it requires the presence of oxygen and the presence of water. If, if you're missing one of these, then corrosion won't occur. Iron, you get this sort of, this is rusting, so this is rusting, and that is going to be the, yeah, the orange color you see is iron oxide, or iron 3 oxide, and then iron 3 oxide is a very brittle substance, and not very strong, so this is why we want to prevent the rusting of iron, because we want to keep the iron strong, and not uh, defective like this. Uh, in some metals, though, the corrosion actually forms a protective layer. Like, for example, this is copper corrosion. So this is copper corrosion. And copper corrosion is actually kind of beneficial because the, the copper oxide that gets created is actually quite, um, quite hard and not brittle, and it actually protects the copper underneath. So in some cases, corrosion is actually a good thing. So this copper, corrosion of copper is good because it actually forms a protective layer on top of the copper. Corrosion in iron is bad because it makes the iron weaker and more susceptible to damage. Now how does this work? Uh, in general, this is how corrosion works with, uh, with most metals. So you have uh, water, so your water and your iron, and the water is basically acts like a cathode because there's a lot of oxygen. No, sorry, not the water. The outside here, the outside, the air, here is the cathode region. There's a lot of oxygen there. Uh, inside the water, by comparison, is the anode region. So there's not a lot of oxygen there. And in this region, the iron gives up electrons near the water. So the water kind of causes the iron to give up electrons and will slowly eat away at. Now the electrons have to go somewhere uh, in order to finish the, um, the corrosion. So if there is uh, oxygen present, then what happens is that the oxygen outside the water will want to absorb the electrons and it'll create uh, hydroxide ions. Now the hydroxide ions will then attract the iron 2 plus and it will create iron hydroxide. And the iron hydroxide will then uh, eventually oxidize to create iron 3 oxide and water and then so on. Now, if this oxygen doesn't, isn't present, then the iron molecules don't have anything to give their electrons to. So this reaction would actually not occur very frequently because the iron would give up the electrons, but the electrons have nowhere to go. So the electrons basically just go back to the iron and this reaction doesn't really proceed with any significant um, progress or any significant amount. If the oxygen were present then, and the water, because the oxygen requires the water, the water basically kind of transports the electrons. With the presence of oxygen in the water, the electrons can then find their way to the oxygen to create this, and then that'll create the rusting that you see down here. So in order for corrosion to occur, you need the oxygen and you need the water because they help facilitate the movement of the electron from the metal. Okay. Now that we know how corrosion works, we can then use the chemistry to help sort of fight it. And there's two ways you can do this. Uh, the first way, and it's the most basic way, and pro also probably the easiest and most cost-effective way, is to simply isolate the metal from the rest of the environment. So if you can prevent the metal from coming into contact with oxygen and water, then the electrons have nowhere to move, so they just stick to the metal. 
the easiest way to do this is, like I said, uh, fairly easy. You just apply a protective layer, such as paint, or you a plastic coating, or a rubber coating. Or you just add another metal on top of it, which is corrosion resistant. Now, the most corrosion resistant metals we use are uh, gold, which is kind of expensive, silver, which is also kind of expensive, and I believe we use chromium in some cases. Okay. So, a corrosion resistant uh, metal will help prevent metal from or the metal underneath from reacting with the, uh, the environment to corrode okay, and the basic idea is that we're preventing water and oxygen from contacting the metal that we're trying to protect this is why we paint our cars because most cars are made of an iron compound or an iron alloy and if you don't paint the car then uh, water and oxygen in the atmosphere will eventually cause the car to rust uh, it's also why if your car has missing paint uh, on it that you should probably cover it up as quickly as possible otherwise it'll start rusting and then uh, get damaged from there. Uh, the second way to prevent it, and this is the more um, interesting way and also probably a lot more, um, how can I put it, a lot more reliable, yeah, is electrochemical protection. Uh, and you basically connect the metal to, well, there's actually two ways to do this. Uh, the first is to connect the metal to what's known as a sacrificial anode. So basically, we put a metal with a higher tendency to corrode on the substance or on the device. Uh, if any of you have ever owned uh, an aluminum boat, sometimes you will find on the boat that there's a magnesium or a zinc strip on the boat that you have to replace every so often. That magnesium or zinc strip is what's known as a sacrificial anode because magnesium and zinc will generally corrode easier than the copper will. So water and the oxygen will cause the zinc or magnesium to corrode before the rest of the boat does. If you don't um, if you don't replace a sacrificial anode every so often, then the corrosion will start occurring on the thing that you're trying to protect. Uh, another way you can protect it using electrochemical protection is simply by passing electricity through the metal. What this does is it gives the right oxygen water uh, because this reaction requires electrons. And by passing electric current through the metal, you can provide this reaction the electrons without having the metal undergo ionization. Uh, this is done quite frequently in the north nowadays because when you purchase a new vehicle in the north, they will usually have anti-rusting electronic device attached to, to the body of the vehicle, and the body and that basically passes an electric current, which gives the body of the vehicle extra electrons so that when the water or when the water and oxygen undergo this reaction they're taking electrons from that uh, electrical current rather than taking electrons from the body of the vehicle what this basically does is that uh, at the heart of it is it changes the chemical condition so that the oxidizing reaction occurs less frequency or le less frequently or the oxidation reaction does occur, but the electrons come from a substance that is not the um, thing you're trying to protect. Okay. There you go. So some examples of uh, applications of electrochemistry and what we can do to prevent rusting, which is a very, very problematic thing with metal objects. All right. So your assignment for today then is as follows. Um, if you guys have any questions, uh, you know how to contact me.